Hey guys, my name is Connor and welcome to my channel, The Way Within. Um, in this video, I want to talk to you about this book here, Return to the Brain of Eden, Restoring the Connection Between Neurochemistry and Consciousness. And the authors are Tony Wright and Graham Ginn. And there's a foreword by Dennis J. McKenna, who's Terence McKenna's brother. Um, so how I found this book was... Um, I just saw a random post on Facebook, um, I can't remember who it was by, but I just came across it on my feed, um, I, I guess just based on the interest that I have and who I was following, and it seemed really interesting, it seemed right up my alley, <clears throat> and it seemed related to the, the areas that I've been studying lately, which is the human diet, you know, frugivory, human history, human evolution, you know, ties all of these areas together. And basically the premise of the book, and it's a really interesting one, is that, uh, so basically it's an alternative view on human evolution and human history and, you know, where we came from, or anatomy or physiology, <clears throat> or species-specific diet. Um, and what the book suggests, the hypothesis of the book, is that humanity evolved in a jungle ecosystem uh, I suppose in Africa um, in the African rainforest and the idea is that humanity evolved in this lush environment where there was copious amounts of fruit especially and our diet primarily consisted of fruit <coughs> and you know, who's to say what the, the ins and outs of that are, you know, maybe some other plants there as well, you know. Um, I know, for example, that bonobos, they chew leaves off the high season when the fruit, when there isn't as much fruit available, they'll wadge leaves in their mouth to get out nutrition that way. Uh, they'll also eat some insects. Um, but when you compare bonobos to chimpanzees, they're you know they're 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 basically the two species that we're most highly related to chimps and bonobos and bonobos are actually far less carnivorous than the chimps the, the bonobos at most they might eat a few insects but i've i've heard that in the high season their diet consists of 98 percent fruit so so basically when fruit is readily available their diet will consist 98 percent of fruit give or take <clears throat> now chimps are a little bit different uh they they do love fruit as well you know there are they are um i would say they're primarily frugivorous as well i'd have to double check that but i do know that chimps they are more they are more uh, prone to eating animal flesh in certain cases you know they're more opportunistic um but i think it's fair to say even with chimps they're primarily herbivorous slash frugivorous as well I don't think there's any one member of the ape family that's primarily carnivorous. Uh, I don't think that apes are designed to eat meat. Um, I think we're designed to eat fruit primarily. I believe that humans especially were frugivorous. And there's a couple of different <coughs> markers in our physiology and anatomy that point to this. And I think I'll have a stronger case for putting that idea forward once I finish this book. I've only just started it, um, but I'm basically so excited about this book and the ideas in it that I wanted to make a quick introductory video to put out some of the basic ideas of the book um, and maybe, you know, put it into people's minds, you know, maybe stoke some interest. If you find the topic interested, interesting yourself, you might be curious to go check out the book and have a look yourself. And then, of course, you can you know, verify the information, you know, for yourself and kind of form your own opinions on it. But I just wanted to share some quick passages from the beginning. I, I started reading it last night and I it was just a very enjoyable read, you know. Every once in a while I come across a book like this that when I read it, it feels like I'm just connecting a lot of the pieces of the puzzle together and it's very exciting 
and it feels like I'm being reminded of the truth or what I feel is the truth and it's like on some level I feel like I've I think we all kind of know I'm not necessarily what's in this I'm just using this as one example but I'm saying I think in a lot of cases we know intuitively what's right what's wrong what's true what's false and sometimes you know you pick up a book or you find some other source of information and when you hear that information it's like it's not so much that you're gaining the information but you're being reminded of it and it can be very gratifying very satisfying um, very reaffirming and that's really the experience I've had with this book even in the first few pages and I can kind of intuit what books are going to do that for me and what ones won't um, and I'm getting better at that as well uh, I think it's about following threads you know like you it's kind of a it's kind of an intuitive process you know like you you're following one area of knowledge and it's really appealing to you and you follow it and then it leads you to a book or something else and it's generally very rewarding and worthwhile um so anyway i read the first i, I read the introduction and the, the forward by dennis mckenna even the first paragraph really stood out to me he says the progress of science and indeed of human knowledge requires a dynamic tension between the mere accumulation of observations and dusty facts and a synthetic process in which the accumulated results of scientific observation and inquiry are woven together into frameworks that in the ideal case create revolutionary paradigms that enhance human understanding of apparently discrete and unrelated aspects of nature. I thought that piece was really nice. And that's kind of the way I look at my research and I suppose a, a lot of what I spend my free time doing is like researching ideas like this and you know reading books and for me what I derive great satisfaction from is like uniting different areas that would seem on the surface to be completely unrelated but somehow there's a connection there and when you bring them together it can like create these new paradigms that are very potent so anyway that's the forward he is Dennis McKenna Terence McKenna's brother so Terence McKenna if you I don't know if you'd know him but he'd be very famous in the psychonaut or psychedelic space so he he was very active in like let's say the 80s and 90s especially um i suppose the 60s and 70s would be more associated with people like timothy leary and alan watts and many others but mckenna really i think came to the fore in the 80s and 90s from what i gather um so he's american but i i think he's based on the surname he's probably of irish stock or scottish maybe um but he was he was a very intelligent guy and he his I suppose his focus was in the area of plant medicines and psychedelics. Um and he passed away I think in either the late nineties or the early two thousands of some form of cancer, unfortunately. Um but his brother is still alive, Dennis. And so he's he's very much on the same wavelength as Terence you know he's into all these kind of fringe areas of science you know these fringe ideas very interesting ideas the whole psychonautic space as well you know the exploration of plant medicines all of that kind of thing so he was brought in for the forward for this and it was a very interesting one um I wanted to read out and analyze these the second half of the forward it's very interesting and it kind of summarizes the the thesis of the book what it's all about so he says evolutionary biologists have long been puzzled by what is perhaps the chief mystery of human origins the explosive and rapid expansion of the human brain in size and complexity over a vanishingly small span of evolutionary time so that is a very like puzzling question like how did the human brain get so big in such 
a relatively short span of time. And I remember even like when I was in school, uh, we were taught that it was because of cooking our food and because of consuming meat, animal flesh. And that idea has still stuck to this day. It's like seen as the, I suppose that's the main theory uh, that, you know, we got, we increased our brain size by cooking our food. You know, they somehow allowed us to access more nutrients and for us to eat more calorie dense foods. And it also allowed us to eat animal flesh more easily, I guess, because we could cook it. It was more palatable. Um, <clears throat> first of all, there, just as an aside, the fact that we have to cook our meat to be able to find it palatable, palatable is questionable, in my opinion. Um, I think we need to look at what foods we find appealing in their raw state, and that will be most correlative to what we're actually anatomically and physiologically and psychologically adapted to eat. And if you look at what raw foods we find most appealing, they're generally fruit and vegetables, maybe some nuts and seeds. Fruit particularly though, it's very colourful and I believe we developed our colour vision by and large to be able to detect fruit in the foliage of the forest. Um, and it's very appealing to us, you know, when you see raw fruit, it makes your mouth water. It looks delicious, you want to eat it. When you see raw meat, it's not very appetizing. And furthermore, it's not just that we cook the meat to make it palatable, but not just that. If you cook meat and you eat it, uh, from what I remember when I used to eat it, it was it's quite bland. So you have to add it plant seasonings and flavorings to it. You know, like spices, sauces, um, in order to make it palatable to our senses. So it's almost like we're coating up that meat with plants again. Uh, to trick our brains into finding it appealing. So that's an aside. Um, but yeah, the, the theory still is that it was cooked food and animal flesh that made our brain grow in size. The other interesting thing about animal flesh is that it's actually been shown to contribute to degenerative diseases such as you know Alzheimer's, dementia. Uh, animal protein itself has been linked to uh, brain degeneration so that seems completely contradictory to this theory and the book from what I gather from reading it so far it delves into that in more detail and it actually paints this picture of how I won't reveal it yet I will in just a second but basically anyway it says I'm not going to give away the story just yet but it says that over time humanity's physiology and anatomy has deteriorated somewhat its brain function has degraded somewhat as a result of following a diet that we i suppose not not only are we not adapted to eat but it's just not ideal for us um yeah and i am of the belief that regarding the brain size thing i'm of the belief that it was actually fruit that led to uh, the rapid development of our brains in a short span of time and that's what this book goes into detail in explaining and providing evidence for and kind of building a hypothesis for that so continuing on he says there is also the mystery of hemispheric lateralization so that basically just means we have two sides to our brain two hemispheres and it seems that the left hemisphere has become somewhat dominant. The left hemisphere is associated with logic, it's associated with mathematics, um, rationality. Um, it filters out information, it categorizes things. The right hemisphere, um, the right hemisphere is associated with, I suppose, it's it's more artistic, it's more creative. Um, it's less logical. It's 
I guess in one sense it's more feminine. It's more associated with the feminine principle. You know, it's like not ordered. It's not logical. Um, but basically, there's this idea that the left hemisphere in humanity has come to dominate the right. That we're lateralized to one side. So there's also the mystery of hemispheric lateralization and the apparent deintegration of the right and left hemispheric functions that we humans suffer. In this work, the authors postulate that it was not always so. The universal myth of a prehistoric golden age, they maintain, is a racial memory that reflects our primate evolution in an arboreal rainforest environment in which humans possessed mental and psychic abilities that have since become lost or atrophied in the profane ages that followed. <clears throat> that rainforest environment favoured a frugivorous diet rich in flavonoids, monoamine oxidase inhibitors and neurotransmitter precursors and relatively low in steroid containing or inducing elements. So basically the idea there is that we, we were consuming a lot of fruit in this forest environment and fruit are like the, the sex organs of plants and they're full of these hormones and I suppose neurochemical uh, analogues that that have like positive effects on our brain, on our body, on DNA transcription. And they, the theory in the book is that they lead to like higher faculties becoming available through continuous consumption. And also epigenetics plays a role because uh, it kind of passes down to the next generation as well as it compounds. The same, so that's a positive kind of upward spiral if you think about that. But then the same also applies to like, let's say eating a diet that we're not adapted to eat, that can compound over generations too and lead to uh, the build-up of, I suppose, genetic mutations that create disease, you know, like the, the, the build-up of diseases themselves. Um, I find it interesting that they mention monoamine oxidase inhibitors as well because uh, the, the only thing I'm aware of that from is that I know it's in it's they're used in ayahuasca. Um I can't remember the exact mechanism but in ayahuasca there's two components. There's a leaf I think and there's a vine. Uh the vine I think is called Banisteriopsis capi and then I can't remember what the leaf is called but I think it's the uh I think it's the bark actually that contains the DMT which is the active component and then the leaf contains monoamine oxidase inhibitors and I think monoamine oxidase is an enzyme in your stomach that breaks down DMT and similar compounds so if you were to just take the vine um, your body would break down the DMT before it has a psychoactive effect whereas if you consume the leaf in combination with the vine um, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors in the leaf will inhibit the enzyme in your stomach and then you'll be able to uh, get the effects from the active component in the vine, DMT. So that's interesting. Um, and that brings me to a point actually I wanted to mention in passing was I was watching a talk by an uh, anthropologist called Wade Davis couple of years ago it's one of my favorite ted talks it's called uh i think it's called cultures at the far edge of the world and it basically journey it chronicles way davis's journeys throughout all over the world basically meeting distant peoples distant tribes different different cultures learning about how they're so different from each other you know what makes them unique And basically the video just showcases how not only do you have the biosphere, but you also have the atmosphere, which is like the tapestry of human culture. And the atmosphere is as threatened, if not more, than the biosphere by globalization, by environmental degradation, you know, by the monetization of relationships, the 
breakdown of community, things like that. Language is disappearing, cultures are disappearing. Um, but I'm digressing there. So basically, Wade Davis he went through the Amazon, and there's actually a great book he wrote called One River. I would recommend you check that out as well. That basically chronicles his journey. Um, he met various tribes in the Amazon, and I don't know if it was him who spoke with a tribesman or he was reporting the story from someone else, but anyway, some Westerner spoke with a tribesman and he was asking him, you know, how did you discover the combination required for ayahuasca? You know, out of hundreds of thousands of plant species, your people and others discovered how to discover the exact leaf to mix with the exact vine to create the desired effects and the tribes person said his response was we went out on the night of a full moon and he says it's very easy we went out in the night of a full moon and on the night of a full moon the plants sing to you in different resonances and you can tell which plants match together and which ones are going to create a good combination, something to that effect. So it sounds ridiculous to a Western mind. It sounds implausible, but from what I gather from this book, they're actually going to, as part of the hypothesis, explain how that even might be possible. They say that in the book, the consumption of fruits and this frugivorous diet it it leads to basically increased uh, not just physical faculties but also mental and even more so psychic or spiritual and it, I think it's quite plausible that if we were in that environment especially over thousands of years and epigenetics was playing a role too that we might have psychic abilities that we're not fully aware of, that some tribes people might still have to an extent, just by virtue of living in a relatively untouched environment, even if their diet isn't 100% there. Although it might be, they might be consuming a lot of fruits and plants themselves. So that's that, and just to read the rest of the forward. So... The, that rainforest environment favoured a frugivorous diet rich in flavonoids, MAO, MAO inhibitors and neurotransmitter precursors and relatively low in steroid containing or inducing elements. Uh, the idea as well is that consuming fruits especially would uh, somehow dampen the effects of various steroids in the body like testosterone, estrogen, also uh, the cortico uh, hormones like cortisol, you know, adrenaline, these stress hormones. Apparently, what, yeah, apparently the the consumption of fre- uh, fruit dampens their effects, and that leads to increased longevity. Um, I don't know what the word they said was. It was increased. Basically, it it leaves you staying young for longer. And at least not just physically, but also mentally, spiritually. So, this dietary regime both mimicked and fostered a state reinforced by positive feedback loops in which pineal functions, including neocortical expansion, so the neocortex is the front part of the brain that's most the most recent development, and it's responsible for a lot of these really high level activities, you know, like language. Um, I suppose metacognition, so being aware of yourself, being aware of your thoughts, all things like that. So including neocortical expansion and hemispheric integration were potentiated. Moreover, these neurochemical feedback loops were amplified in succeeding generations via the regulation of gene expression in the developing fetus. Independent of conventional evolutionary mechanisms of mutation and natural selection. So basically what that's saying is it's talking about epigenetics, which is what I mentioned earlier. So 
epigenetics is this form of evolution that is beyond just the gene beyond just genetic mutation and it really really throws a spanner in the works of the, the views of people like Richard Dawkins um, you know these kind of materialist reductionist scientists who believe that everything just comes down to the gene that's not true um, we can pass on adaptations that we've learnt to the next generation through epigenetics so our behavior influences the following generation it's not just about physical traits and mating it's about your behavior even your thoughts can influence your genetic expression and it can influence the genetic destiny of those to come so this dietary regime basically it had a compounding effect so as i was saying there's there's cycles there's a positive feedback loop or a negative feedback loop what the book is saying is that eating this fruit rich diet and all the positive effects that came with that generation after generation in the forest it was compounding and it was accelerating these effects and these benefits in each generation to come climate changes or other environmental catastrophes forced several lineages of hominids as well as archaic and early humans out of their forest dwelling ancestral homes into much harsher savanna or grassland environments as a consequence dietary regimes shifted towards roots tubers grass seed and a greater proportion of animal protein triggering a reversal of the positive effects uh, the positive feedback loops that had sustained pineal potentiation and the pineal gland is said to be related to higher spiritual functions uh, even things like telepathy um, intuition uh, discernment things like that and hemispheric integration in the paradisiacal forest dwelling golden age and that's the other thing as well the other side of this is that if you look to any of the religions or ancient philosophies they all point to like a golden age so Ovid and Hesiod they, ancient Greek philosophers they talked of a golden age and which led to the silver age the bronze age and uh, the current iron age and the religions also talk about this like in i think it's hinduism you have the yuga cycle uh, so the kali yuga is the lowest uh, which is what we're apparently in now and a lot of these things as well like you know the flood in christianity a lot of it is to do with cataclysm. There's some kind of environmental disaster, some major shift that occurred maybe 20, 30 thousand years ago or beyond that caused some kind of fall, the fall of mankind, you know, the fall as it's called in Christianity. Pineal dominance was disrupted by steroid mediated testosterone driven functions, primarily due to the reduced consumption of flavonoids and other steroid inhibitory dietary factors changes in the dietary patterns that were forced on the population by this migration put an end to the rapid evolution of the human brain and triggered its devolution ultimately resulting in the damaged human neural architecture that we suffer from today and the myriad mental and physical deficits that are the legacy of a biological fall from grace um yeah that's it basically it goes on another bit but it's just saying that it's not the place of the forward to lay out the whole thesis so but i think that's a good introduction to the subject matter of the book and i'm gonna read this and i'm gonna come back with another video where i explore the ideas in more detail and i suppose provide more evidence for the stance but i find it very interesting so i just wanted to put it out there to begin with and if you're curious, I just recommend that you go look for the book and check it out. It's called Return to the Brain of Eden. And the authors are Tony Wright and Graham Ginn. So yeah, that's it for this video. You know, I think it's my belief that what they're saying is true. I'm open to being proven wrong, but... That's what I believe, you know. I think that we came from a forest-dwelling environment 
the savannah I don't think was the cradle of humanity I think it was the rainforest and we got pushed out onto the savannah because of some major event whether it was environmental or otherwise and that led to a change in our diet originally we were eating lots of fruits high fruit diet and this had really positive effects on our just on our well-being on our longevity but also our mental functioning and that's because of the basic physiology and structure of fruits they're basically the highest production of plants they're like you know they're they're, they're like the, the magnus open of or the magnum opus of plants you know they're the best thing they can produce it's like all of their effort all of their nutrition goes into the production of the fruits which are the sex organs of the plants so they're loaded with these hormones that have beneficial effects on us it's a symbiotic relationship basically and that developed and they have these flavonoids as well and other compounds that actually mediate or dampen the effects of stress hormones in our body and basically keep us in a more joyous harmonious state so it's very it goes very deep it's very far reaching uh, i only have the faintest idea of what it's about right now so i'm looking forward to reading the book and i'll come back with another video summarizing what i've learned and hopefully putting pu putting forth a solid hypothesis to um lend this idea some weight so thanks for watching see you in the next video